Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is our fall Fairhaven Lecture Series. We are exploring the fall, excuse me, the 2020 election. Um, lots to talk about, of course. Um, today, uh, we're continuing that discussion. Um, Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater has hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series since 1983. Typically, we hold our lectures that are open to the public over at Fairhaven Senior Services. But this year, like everyone else, we have gone virtual and we have invited our presenters to talk via WebEx. We are recording today's lecture, so if you're watching us some other time. I hope you're enjoying uh, the lecture, but let's go ahead um, and get started with today's lecture. We have with us Dr. Richard Haven. He is a professor emeritus of communication at UW-Whitewater. He is one of the 135 scholars who helped determine the 100 greatest American speeches of the 20th century. Dr. Haven is a regular guest expert on WFAW's Morning Magazine and NB C15 in Madison, and of course, he's a, he's a great friend to the Fairhaven Lecture Series. So please, um, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Dick Haven. Thank you, Carrie. It's great to be here. I, folks, I wish we could be together and, uh, in Fairhaven. Uh, I miss the ability to uh, see your faces, to uh, uh, interact with you before we start, and of course, to uh, uh, you get that feedback from you as I'm talking. But we are in a pandemic, and of course, that's part of what we're talking about today. You know, the election that's coming up in uh, about two weeks is dominated by the coronavirus. It's COVID-19. And as much as uh, one of the candidates would love to talk about other things, uh, it is the central issue of this election. Well, the idea that a crisis is the central election, uh, issue of a, an election, especially involving an incumbent, is not unusual. And we're going to take a look at three past elections involving incumbents uh, that were dominated by a particular crisis or, in a couple of cases, by two crises. In the first one we're going to look at, we're going back all the way to 1864. This one I'm certain none of you were alive at. And in that election, Abraham Lincoln was up for re-election in the middle of the Civil War. Now, you know, that crisis began with Lincoln's election in 1860, and it would become the only issue that dominated his entire time in office up including his, until his assassination. So, uh, you know, it was a dominant issue. It's, it's generally regarded as the most significant crisis the country has ever faced. Well, Lincoln insisted that there be an election in 1864, even though he feared he would lose that election. He believed it was important to demonstrate that the Union could still operate, even though it was uh, no longer united and in the middle of fighting a horrendous war. Now, the war, as we know, really began in 1861, and uh, both sides thought that this war would go fast. They thought it would be one big battle, one side or the other would win, and it would be over. Uh, some folks even rode out to that first battle in their carriages and had picnics up on the hills watching the battle. It didn't go well. And of course, by 1864, uh, the war had dragged on for so long and been so bloody that there was a lot of uh, disagreement about whether it made any sense to continue fighting it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the big issues facing Lincoln was the growing resentment to the war, how it had been conducted, when it would end, and whether it was worth fighting. Uh, many thought it made more sense, and this is in the North, to simply let the South go, let them be their own country, and 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 have their northern country be uh, rid of them. But Lincoln didn't see that, and those who supported Lincoln did not agree, and he believed that you had to finish the war, you had to win the war, and you had to preserve the Union. And of course, we also know that he believed by this time in 64 that you had to end slavery, that in his mind it had become the key issue leading to the war, and it would make no sense to end the war without ending slavery. So in 1864, as they're putting together the 
uh, campaign, he's facing not only opposition from the Democrats, <coughs> he uh, is also facing opposition from his own party. Most notably, uh, John Fremont, who would uh, be to the left of Lincoln and <coughs> as a radical Republican being, uh, would run in the election until he pulled out before voting day. And he believed that Lincoln was not going far enough in terms of what he was doing to try to not only win the war, but deal with the South. So Lincoln faced uh, disagreements in his own party. He faced a Democratic Party that was split, but came together on its candidate, and that was George McClellan. That, of course, if you remember the Civil War, <clears throat> McClellan was uh, the uh, general in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And Lincoln wasn't happy with him because while he was a good parade general, he wasn't a good fighting general, in Lincoln's opinion. And therefore, uh, Lincoln eventually replaced him. Well, McClellan, of course, uh, had a pretty big ego, and he didn't care for that. And so even though he was still in the Army, he announced that he would be a candidate. And he was selected by the Democratic Party to be that candidate. They believed a Civil War general, who was pretty popular, incidentally, uh, would make a, uh, a formidable candidate, and Lincoln thought that too. But the Democratic Party was split between those <clears throat> who wanted to continue the war and those who wanted to uh, set up a peace right away and, and end the war without uh, ending slavery, without really uh, changing anything. And so that split would cause a problem for McClellan because McClellan wanted to continue the fight. He just thought he would be better at it than Lincoln. All right, Lincoln and the Republicans decided uh, to combat this situation, they would form a union party, a special party that would have Lincoln as the candidate for president, and then a uh, senator from Tennessee, Johnson, who would be his vice president, a former Democrat. And so this would be a unifying party. Now, this was one of the great mistakes that Lincoln made. He was not, Johnson, a good choice, as we know what happens after Lincoln was assassinated. But nonetheless, <clears throat> that was the reason. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, uh, you know, the war continued to do poorly. There were a number of battles in 1864 that the Confederates won. And so this did not help Lincoln's cause. Lincoln's uh, key advisor, his Secretary of State, Edwin Stanton, or, uh, Stanton uh, came up with the idea that they should find a way to allow the troops to vote. You know, there were uh, about a million soldiers in the Union Army. And so they uh, were saying, why wouldn't they be allowed to vote? This idea that, well, they could vote by mail, because remember, they're down south. They're in Virginia, and they're in uh, Alabama and Georgia. <clears throat> so now the question was, how do you make that happen? And so the proposals were put out. Now, the proposals were put out, <clears throat> as they are today, on a state-by-state -state basis. So this concept of mail-in uh, voting was proposed, and that's, this will be the first time, first election in 1864, when there's widespread mail-in voting. But they also <clears throat> looked at the possibility of representatives from, <clears throat> from the different states who approved of, of, of off-site voting to send representatives to the battlefield and collect ballots. Uh, we have that concept today where some people are said they can collect the ballots and turn them in for other people. Well, this was controversial, of course, and, uh, and, and so there were efforts made in different states, including court cases, sound familiar, and, uh, and the state had to decide whether they would allow it. Now, the interesting thing in American history, Pennsylvania was the first state to use uh, off-site or mail-in voting. They did so in the War of 1812, but no one really uh, pursued it until the Civil War. Wisconsin happened to be the first state to approve this in 1862. So it was, uh, Wisconsin was ahead of the game. Eventually, more than 20 states approved it, 
Some states did not. For example, Illinois and Indiana, that had Democratic legislators dominated by the Democratic Party, uh, voted it down. But uh, Wisconsin had a Republican Party legislature, and so did other states. And so uh, more than 20 states said they would do it. Some of the states, including Wisconsin, allowed the soldiers to fill out their ballot and put it in the mail themselves. Other states said, no, uh, we're going to send our representatives down and set up tables, essentially, voting areas uh, where the soldiers could vote. In the end, this process produced about 150,000 votes. Now, Lincoln would end up winning the election by about 400 and plus thousand. But those 150,000 split about 78% for Lincoln and only 22% for McClellan. So uh, the decision to go after the, the soldiers' votes was an instinctive decision by Lincoln that paid off. He was fairly certain that the soldiers who had been carrying the burden and believed in the battles in the fight would support him, and they did. The other way the soldiers supported him which is interesting, not only did they vote, uh, those that did, they didn't have to, and many did, chose not to vote, but those who did, they also, many wrote letters home to their parents, to their spouses, and other relatives urging them to vote for Lincoln. So here are the voices of these men fighting in, in the trenches in the Civil War in the South, and they're campaigning for Lincoln. So this became a key part of Lincoln's campaign. Now, there was a, a, an October surprise that also occurred, and that happened actually in September. At the beginning of September, Lincoln got a message from General Tecumseh Sherman, and his message was that uh, Atlanta is now Lincoln's, that Atlanta has fallen. When the news spread that Atlanta had fallen, and then other battles were, uh, victories were coming in for the Union, that uh, also helped to swing the vote to Lincoln. In the end, Lincoln easily won re-election, but it's fascinating to note that he not only, uh, you know, used mail-in voting and uh, set the standard, and incidentally, that standard would remain for all wars after the Civil War. And of course, even today we know that soldiers stationed around the world, whether they're in Korea or they're in Iraq or they're in Afghanistan, wherever they may be, Germany, for example, are able to vote and mail in their ballots. <clears throat> so that was the beginning of that kind of process, and it's one that's worked very well. And uh, rarely, if ever, has there been concern about it. So in 1864, Abraham Lincoln faced with this greatest crisis to face the American Union, was able to win re-election in a, in a difficult election, in a controversial setting, and did so through mail-in ballots, through ballots collected and then brought back to the individual states. And in the end, Lincoln won every state <clears throat> except uh, three. And of course, remember, there were <clears throat> 11 states who were not able to vote because they were in the Confederacy. So that was our first election and the first example of an incumbent facing a controversial crisis and uh, finding a way, in this case, using both mail-in ballots and uh, collecting ballots from the battlefield, as well as uh, having a, a so-called October surprise in September that helped him uh, win re-election and go on. Now, our second election that we're going to look at uh, takes us up to 1940, and this one involves Franklin Roosevelt. Now, it's no surprise that Roosevelt should be on this list because he actually dealt with two crises. Uh, we're go we'll get to 1940, but you all know that he's elected in 1932 and defeats an incumbent president, Herbert Hoover. So Roosevelt is most remembered for that inauguration speech he gave in 33, in which he talked about uh, the nation had nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, he began to deal with the crisis of the Great Depression through the New Deal. He thought that the election of 1936 was going to be uh, 
a, uh, a, a real test. He believed that the test would not come from the Republican Party, but would come from his own party. And like Lincoln in 1864, he had a candidate to the left of him who was most likely to be that opponent and would challenge Roosevelt, he believed, in the primaries or in the convention to be the nominee for 36. That candidate was Huey Long. Now, Huey Long uh, was a demagogue. He was a charismatic governor and senator from Louisiana. If you've ever seen the movie, All the King's Men, uh, then you, you know that that's about Huey Long. Long uh, became disenchanted with Roosevelt because he believed Roosevelt in his first term wasn't doing enough to attack capitalism and uh, essentially uh, support the working classes who ha were, were carrying the brunt of the Great Depression. You might remember that Long proposed, uh, uh, you know, that every uh, family should get $10,000, just be given money. And, uh, and he really was proposing uh, a, a concept where he called it every man a king. <clears throat> well, these concepts of not, you know, in a sense, Roosevelt was supporting the capitalist system with changes. Some of them considered socialist changes, but nonetheless, they would help the capitalist system to survive. Long was really going after, in a very populist movement, and using very demagogic rhetoric, uh, attempt to create a very different kind of environment that uh, essentially ignored capitalism and simply would provide a wealth right directly to all of the citizens. Well, uh, in the end, 1936 was not a problem for Roosevelt because Huey Long was assassinated in 1935. So the 1936 election was easily won. Now, as we move towards 1940, <clears throat> Roosevelt now has some problems. First of all, uh, he tries to pack the Supreme Court. You've heard about that. And the Supreme Court uh, had been making decisions on the New Deal programs, declaring a number of them uh, unconstitutional. And uh, Roosevelt wanted to pack the court, that means to expand it, so that he could get his programs through and uh, have them continue to fight the, the Great Depression. <clears throat> Another problem for Roosevelt was that there was a, a, a recession that hit in 1938. And the recession uh, really hurt the Democrats and Roosevelt because it looked like the, the New Deal was failing and that it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do, and that is to really end the Great Depression. So uh, Roosevelt, coming into 1940, was in a somewhat precarious position in terms of the economy and domestic issues. Well, the second crisis that comes along for Roosevelt, of course, is the start of World War II. And remember, the start of World War II is 1939, as the Nazis in Germany begin to invade Poland, uh, take over Austria, they begin to expand. And uh, this will become that second crisis, a crisis that even though it, has, it won't really hit home for the United States until 1941, December 7th, uh, Roosevelt knows that it's likely the United States is going to be pulled into the war. And so he now uh, you know, is trying in any way he can prior to the 40 election to build support for England by, which by that time is the only country left standing in Europe, and uh, do so in a way that doesn't violate a sense of neutrality, which was a, a kind of a high wire act, if you would, for Roosevelt. At the time, there was an organization known as America First, and that organization's chief spokesman was Charles Lindbergh, the superstar of 1927, who made that initial solo flight from uh, the United States to France. Lindbergh was an out, uh, outspoken opponent of any involvement of the United States in the European war. And, and so America, and this was an immensely popular program. And so Roosevelt was butting heads with 
Lindbergh and others, there was a strong group of Republican senators, including uh, Robert Taft, <clears throat> who was hoping to be the candidate in 1940. He was the son of uh, William Howard Taft, the president after Theodore Roosevelt. In any case, uh, the, the, what was going on in England in the war uh, that had begun uh, in Europe uh, began to take over and dominate the headlines, the issues, and it had an effect on the Republican Party. The Republican Party had a number of candidates who were uh, vying to become that opponent of Roosevelt's, and they included uh, uh, Senator Vandenberg of Michigan, a leading isolationist, uh, Senator Taft from Ohio, a young uh, uh, New York, uh, soon to be New York governor, Thomas Dewey of New York, and then an upstart businessman from uh, born in Indiana but residing in New York City. He was the president of, an inter of a utility holding company, Wendell Wilkie. And Wilkie uh, was a uh, charismatic, uh, he was a very good extemporaneous speaker, and I know a lot about Wendell Wilkie because I got to focus on him for my master's thesis while at Ball State University in 1972. And I needed a topic for my master's thesis, and my uh, advisor suggested I check out Wendell Wilkie because no one had ever focused on the speeches he gave prior to the convention in Philadelphia in 1940. Well, I, I, I grew up in a town called Newcastle. I was going to Ball State in Muncie, and just south of Newcastle is a town named Rushville. Well, it turns out that Wendell Wilkie's son, Philip Wilkie, was a lawyer in Rushville. And Philip Wilkie had been uh, in uh, college. He was at Harvard, same time as Jack Kennedy. They used to debate each other uh, in, 19, in, in the late 30s, 1940. So I went and visited Philip Wilkie, and I told him I was interested in studying the pre-convention speeches. Well, when I walked into his office, his law office, it was loaded with 1940 campaign paraphernalia. Here was every speech given by Wendell Wilkie in the campaign, as well as lots of uh, newspaper clippings and other accounts, uh, articles from magazines. And so now I had what uh, any researcher uh, uh, drools for. I had actual access to original documents, and then I had access to two people who had been inside the Wilkie campaign, Philip Wilkie the son and his mother. Philip Wilkie's mother and Wendell Wilkie's wife, Edith, was still alive. She was 84, and she lived in New York City. And while I was doing my research, he told me, Philip, he said, my mom's coming to visit. And I told her she will have to spend an hour with you. He made her do it. And so I got a chance to, in, to interview Edith Wilkie, who, as the wife of Wendell, snuck into the Philadelphia Convention and sat up in the high bleachers and watched as he won the nomination. Now, the interesting thing about it is that Wilkie, uh, who had been a New Deal supporter and a Democrat until 39, dropped out of the party, joined the Republican Party, and then by 1940, he's their candidate. Well, this was not setting well with some Republicans because they didn't view him as a legitimate Republican. But nonetheless, he pulled it off. And he pulled it off, I think, because he was the only main candidate who uh, moved away from isolationism and supported uh, the uh, allies and especially Britain in the war effort. The American people had been changing as they watched and heard what was happening in, uh, in Europe. And uh, Wilkie was able to move the Republican Party away from its isolationist stand and into an interventionist stand. And so by the time the 1940 election came along, Roosevelt was not facing an isolationist. He was facing another interventionist. This meant that he could not have to worry about being criticized by their candidate for what he was doing behind the scenes to aid Britain. Rather, he was uh, going to be attacked mainly on economic issues. Wilkie, being an, a businessman, 
and an articulate man, was uh, very good at attacking Roosevelt for the economic failures, he argued, of the New Deal. And if the war had not started, if the concept, if the issues had been mainly economic and domestic, Wilkie would have had a real shot at defeating Franklin Roosevelt. So for Franklin Roosevelt, the key in 1940, and remember the other issue we haven't mentioned is that Roosevelt was breaking the third term tradition of George Washington. He would be the first president not only to run for a third term as a major party candidate, but to succeed. And incidentally, he's the last one uh, because a constitutional amendment was passed to prohibit presidents from being able to do that. So in any case, uh, Roosevelt facing two crises, the, 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 the Great Depression and the beginnings of World War II, facing re-election and breaking the third term during a, a recession and, and during the start of World War II was able to succeed. He, uh, you know, Wilkie gave him a good run for his money, but uh, in the end, uh, it was a fairly easy victory for Roosevelt. So what we see is that, you know, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a master politician, not unlike Abraham Lincoln. Both of them master politicians. And Roosevelt did a great job of walking that tightrope between uh, aiding the Allies but trying to preserve neutrality. But at the same time, he got a nice surprise by the nomination of Wendell Wilkie. <clears throat> because it took the isolationist voice away from the candidate and put the entire issue uh, on the Great Depression. But by the time of the election, more Americans were concerned about what was coming, not what, the, what happened in the past. And so I think because of the expectation that America would eventually be drawn into the war, uh, they were more satisfied to have Roosevelt in that seat than Wendell Wilkie. Wilkie, incidentally, after the election, after the war began, became uh, a roving ambassador for Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, he became famous for a book he wrote called One World. He was a big advocate of the United Nations. So in any case, that's Franklin Roosevelt, and that's the election of 1940. Well, how are we doing? All right, we have one more election, and then I'll get to questions. The first, the, the election of 1968 gives us an incumbent who will not win re-election, and that was Lyndon Johnson. Now, Johnson, like Lincoln and Roosevelt, was a master politician. He had honed his skills in the United States Senate and knew how to get things done, to get uh, uh, issues passed. And of course, he was an accidental president, becoming president in 1963 because of the assassination of John Kennedy. But you know, he surprised people. Here he was, this uh, former senator from Texas, vice president, and uh, John Kennedy is assassinated. He becomes president. There's an assumption that being a southerner, uh, he's not going to do anything on civil rights. And of course, the two issues, the crises that he faced was the Civil Rights Movement and the Vietnam War. Now, in 1963-64, he surprises people. And uh, fairly soon after becoming president because of assassination, he announces that uh, to honor Jack Kennedy, he's going to propose and push the Civil Rights Bill that had been languishing. And because of the groundswell of support and, and, and concern, he moves on and then uh, eventually gets that Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. And uh, the photo that we have in the uh, LBJ section is of Vietnam, but there's a photo in, and I don't have it for you, of 1964 that shows Martin Luther King Jr. standing behind him as he signs the Civil Rights Act of 64. Remember how much civil rights from 1955, we call that the beginning of the second movement in the 20th century, to 1964 had been the dominant domestic issue in the country, both because of Dr. King's work, especially in the South with his nonviolent protest movement, 
but also because of what was happening with people like Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael and Eldridge Cleaver and others in the North who were uh, advocating a much uh, of what would Stokely Mike Carmichael would call the Black Power Movement. So this was a critical time. So Johnson takes that action. That surprised people. Now he comes up for election in 64, and I think Johnson expected because he had supported civil rights, he might have trouble in the South. Turned out he didn't. Uh, Barry Goldwater, the nominee in 64, the Republicans from Arizona, opposed the Civil Rights Act, but did not uh, advocate in the ways that a George Wallace would later advocate. And uh, Johnson easily won election and now moved on in to 65. And again, the Vietnam War has begun, uh, but doesn't really take hold until Lyndon Johnson's uh, term after 64 election. So in 65, Johnson uh, now supports the Voting Rights Act. This one was, he felt, the most important of the two acts because it really drove a stake in the heart of what was happening in the South, and that was the idea that they could control who could access the ballot or uh, you know, how they could access the ballot. And so the Voting Rights Act would end a lot of the shenanigans that prevented uh, African Americans in the South from voting. All right, Johnson's support of that act really angered the Southern Democrats the white Democrats, and that's when the, the beginnings of those Southern Democrats, uh, like Jesse Helms and others, would eventually move and change to the Republican Party, usually by the late 60s, early 70s. Johnson knew that when he took those actions of 64 and 65, uh, he had lost the South. But he believed it was the right thing to do, and it's probably uh, the example of a president standing up and doing something that doesn't benefit him politically, but because he believes it's the right thing to do. Now, unfortunately for, for Johnson, the Vietnam War began to escalate. We, we know about the beginnings of the war from Jack Kennedy on into the Johnson administration, but as the escalation started and the war became more deadly, more pronounced, then it became more controversial. And as Johnson was pursuing the 1968 election, uh, the war had become uh, such a uh, center point, it overwhelmed civil rights, it was the domestic issue because of the anti-war movement. And many of us, of course, here in Wisconsin know a lot about that from the demonstrations that occurred on the Whitewater campus, but especially on the Madison campus. And uh, you know, eventually it would split the Democratic Party. Uh, and so as Johnson began to consider re-election, uh, he entered the New Hampshire primary in uh, January, I believe, and uh, he won that primary, but barely over Eugene McCarthy, a senator from Minnesota, who was an anti-war Democrat. And so Johnson saw the writing on the wall and knew that he was gonna have a tough time, and so he announced to the American people in a surprise speech that he would not be a candidate, he would not seek reelection, and he withdrew. This threw it open to Eugene McCarthy, Robert Kennedy, and eventually Hubert Humphrey, and they would fight it out. We know, of course, what happens there. Robert Kennedy's assassinated, Humphrey becomes the candidate, but we also know that the convention in Chicago becomes a holy mess. As you all recall that that convention, uh, and it was shown on television, involved the police beating the anti-war demonstrators who were uh, rioting outside the convention hall. There was uh, animosity in the convention hall between the anti-war representatives and the pro-administration, uh, pro-war administration. So in the end, that split in the Democratic Party would enable Richard Nixon to become president in 1969. And Lyndon Johnson, faced with these dual crises, his response to civil rights followed by the Vietnam War, would in, when in the end cost him a chance at reelection in 1968. So what we've looked at, three presidents, Abraham Lincoln, 
1864, in the middle of the greatest crisis to affect the American nation, the Civil War. Franklin Roosevelt and his struggles with the Great Depression and eventually the beginnings of World War II, two enormous crises. And both men were successful in re-election. And then Lyndon Johnson, who was able to survive and win in 64, but not his actual re-election in 68. And there he would uh, withdraw, knowing that he would probably be defeated within the party, I think he guessed. But in any case, uh, the split in the Democratic Party led to the election of Richard Nixon. So there you go. A little history, presidential elections during a time of crisis. It's nothing new for America. And unfortunately, we're living through one of those crises right now. I'm glad to take questions. Excellent presentation, Professor Haven. That's great. Um, it sometimes takes a couple minutes for people to formulate their questions in the chat box, so we'll give them a little bit of time to do that. We do have one uh, sort of series of questions that we can start with, and, and they involve, um, you know, sort of a what-if scenario. To what degree do you think today's social media or instant news may have impacted the crisis uh, elections of Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Johnson? And can you imagine to what extent the tweets of these three uh, presidents would have been during their time? Well, there's no question that uh, the way we communicate today is so different. But each era had its own rumors, uh, you know, misinformation. You know, during the 1864 election, uh, the most typical argument made uh, and sent out in newspapers, and remember, in 1864, newspapers were generally owned by one of the two major parties. Lincoln even owned a German language paper in uh, St. Louis, and that helped him in 1860. So those who opposed Lincoln uh, would use their newspapers to spread, uh, you know, uh, rumors, misinformation, and uh, the Republican newspapers will be very supportive and would attack the other candidate. So they had their own kind of media and, and would have that effect. But uh, in the case of Roosevelt and Johnson, Roosevelt was more dominated by radio, and he was a, a master politician and realized the power of radio. Uh, his fireside chats, and incidentally, he was never next to a fireside, but his fireside chats became famous, and that was his way of bypassing the newspapers and going directly to the American people. So he was one of the first uh, candidates to make great use of radio. Lyndon Johnson, uh, you know, was not as, uh, as well a regarded speaker as Roosevelt or Lincoln, although he does have, I think, three uh, speeches on the top 100 of the 20th century. But uh, he was a savvy politician, and he knew how to work the Congress and, and work the audience. And so he was very successful in 64 because of the way he campaigned. And there they used rumors about Goldwater uh, to help defeat Goldwater, including the most famous television commercial, which ran only once on ABC, never on the other networks. And that was the uh, little girl picking the flowers and as she counts, is, her counting is taken over by someone counting down to the explosion of a nuclear bomb, which you see go off in her eye. And then you hear President Johnson say uh, this, you know, that you have to have someone in the Oval Office who can be trusted, who can deal with this kind of uh, immense power, implying that Barry Goldwater could not be trusted to do it. So it was different. But at the same time, uh, there was always uh, ways in which misinformation, rumors, uh, political attacks found their way. I think today, unfortunately, with the kinds of media we have, we're seeing uh, too much divisiveness enhanced by how quickly information can travel on the web. So along those lines of communication, um, the next couple of questions kind of tie back to what, you know, the, today's election. Uh, the first is, you know, was personality and communication styles of, of Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Johnson as prominent for their elections as it appears to be for Trump's bid for re-election? Well, <clears throat> each had their own style, but no, very different, I think. Uh, when you look at Lincoln, 
uh, Link, you know, Lincoln uh, had an image, you know, Honest Abe was one way he was characterized, uh, the uh, South characterized him other ways, his opponents, but, uh, you know, they, they would reinforce that image, but they didn't do nearly as much campaigning uh, in the 19th century as we see in the 21st century or in the 20th century. So uh, for Lincoln, it was very different. Lincoln, we think more of his famous speeches, his uh, most notable debate, of course, occurred not for president, but in uh, 1857 for the Senate seat in Illinois, in which the Lincoln-Douglas debates occurred. So they happened all in Illinois. I think the closest one to us was in Freeport. The, uh, so he didn't have that same kind of circumstance. The uh, campaigning then was done by surrogates. And though we still have surrogates today, it's, we expect the candidate to be out and about or in a pandemic to at least be on uh, the, uh, you know, uh, on the internet live talking to us when possible. So, uh, yeah, you know, different. I think what you're seeing with President Trump is, uh, you know, he's uh, so fixated on these live, uh, large audience events even when there is criticism of it, and it keeps reminding people of the pandemic because that's what everybody reports, is that how does this fit in with the, you know, the concerns about the pandemic? But that's his style, that's when he's happiest, is to be at those large events and have that audience reaction. Sticking with um, the current election, how do you see uh, Trump and Biden's actions to influence this election as very similar or very different to the others that you discussed today? Well, uh, first of all, in, in terms of this election, uh, the biggest debate has been what is central for the American people. Uh, Vice President, former Vice President Biden has done a very good job of keeping the coronavirus as the primary issue, uh, believing that many Americans, and opinion polls back this up, uh, do not believe the president has done a good job handling uh, COVID-19. And so by keeping that as the primary issue, then uh, Vice President Biden believes he has a very good chance to win. President Trump has tried to downplay the, the virus, the, the, the pandemic. He's talked about how it's turned the corner, it's going away, and he wants to focus on the economy and argue that how the economy was before uh, this hit, the pandemic, uh, could happen again, and therefore he believes, and he, in opinion polls back him up, that he gets better uh, support from the American people for handling the economy than he does for any other issue. So a lot of it today has to do with that. Well, you certainly see that in different ways. I mean, in Lyndon Johnson in 1968, uh, he was trapped with Vietnam, and much like Biden has try to keep the focus on the pandemic for President Trump, uh, whether it was uh, Eugene McCarthy and Robert Kennedy and other anti-war senators kept the war as the focus on Johnson, Johnson would have liked to have talked about the great society, about civil rights, about what else was going on, and, and, and not have the war and the anti-war movement become so central to the Democratic Party's deliberations. So you uh, mentioned that each of these elections had two crises, you know, going on at the same time. Currently, um, we're talking about at least two, you know, with the pandemic, but also, you know, the economy, social justice issues, even some environmental, some natural disasters. I mean, so so really, we could be talking about two, three, four crises going on this time around. Yeah, the economy, I think, is a direct result of the, the pandemic. But, you know, it's interesting, uh, the other possibility that has not taken hold as much as I think people thought it would is the climate crisis and the whole question of, uh, of climate change. And we've been watching uh, this, you know, series of hurricanes all travel through Louisiana. Just for some reason, the hurricanes love Louisiana. And then the fires. Uh, just so awful as they've burnt out in California and now in Colorado. So, uh, you know, that could have been the second crisis, but it's not taken hold. To a certain extent, I think race relations, 
and what we saw happen in Minneapolis and then Kenosha and uh, in Portland and Seattle and other places might be the other crises. And it's a question of how that crisis is defined. President Trump wants to define it as a law and order crisis. Vice President Biden has, caught, has defined it as a racial uh, relations crisis and a time for the nation to come together and finally address the systemic racism, he argues, that is inherent in the nation. So we'll sort of end the lecture here by putting you on the spot a little bit and, you know, asking what your predictions are for November 2nd. Will we know November 2nd what the results are? When will we know? What What do you see here two weeks from now? You really want to put me on the spot, don't you? Uh, the, the answer on when we will know, it, it will depend upon particular states. Now, one of the reasons we may know sooner than later is because of the early voting. And there's so much early voting going on along with the mail-in or the absentee voting that, uh, you know, some states can process those early votes, those absentee ballots, those mail ballots much faster than some other states. So it depends on where and how those states go. You know, if if on November, late on November 3rd, Florida goes to Biden, then you know that probably Biden's going to be president because I don't think Donald Trump has a path to the presidency without Florida. Uh, same thing with, uh, with Georgia. Uh, if he were to lose Georgia, that's another indication that he's probably going to lose. So some of those Eastern time zone states like Florida and Georgia may tell us something, but then we move into the Midwest and the central time zone and what happens with Pennsylvania or uh, Mass excuse me, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. And if in fact, uh, Florida's gone to Trump and Georgia's gone to Trump and things are kind of uh, moving along the way they did in 2016, then there'll be a lot of focus on what's happening in the Midwest and especially in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin and how those states go. And that's where you could have controversy if there are challenges to which ballots are being counted. It won't be hanging chads this time, but it could be uh, whether or not uh, some of the absentee ballots in a state like Wisconsin or Pennsylvania <coughs> uh, are, are challenged and therefore slow down the process of determining a winner. So we're, we're, we'll watch. It's hard to tell at this point. Uh, it certainly does seem to be that we're having a large turnout. How large that turnout is and where that large turnout is, is at this point what's going to determine this election. Because uh, again, it depends on, at this point, who votes and whether their votes count. And the absentee ballot, bail-in ballot issue is one of concern because as you, if, you, if you've cast an absentee ballot in Wisconsin, if you don't have a witness not only identified but sign it, it will be thrown out. So, you know, you have those kinds of, of uh, trip wires on that process. In Pennsylvania, uh, they have a double envelope. And if you turn in the uh, mail-in ballot or the absentee ballot in the single envelope without the second envelope, it'll be thrown out. That was determined by the state Supreme Court there. So that's another complication. And because, and this always happens, but we have so many more of them now. It becomes a much more critical question of how well did people do in following directions and filling out their ballots absentee or mail-in correctly. Well, one thing, um, oh, here's another, uh, just one other question here. Um, how was the transition of presidential, how was the transition of power for the three, uh, the three presidents you talked about today? Well, I understand in the case of Abraham Lincoln, he was incumbent, same with Franklin Roosevelt, so there was no transition of power. In the case of Donald Trump and Lyndon Johnson, in the case of Lyndon Johnson, then the transition was to Richard Nixon. That was not a happy time for Lyndon Johnson, but <clears throat> uh, it, was, it was a smooth transition. There was not a problem there. Uh, in the case of this election, unfortunately, the presidents made this an issue uh, about whether or not it's a fair election, whether he will accept it, and so on. Uh, 
And so that's raised issues. My prediction is that, in fact, if uh, Joe Biden wins the presidency, I think there'll be a smooth transition. We'll hear a lot of noise, but I think in the end, it'll be smooth. Well, one thing we do know for sure is that on November 3rd, we will get our commercials back to normal <laughs> here in Wisconsin, at least. We can count on that. They won't continue the ads after the second, so. Uh, you would think so. <laughs> so with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. And Professor Richard Haven, thank you so much for your lecture today. And as always, um, being such a friend to the Fairhaven Lecture Series, many of your uh, past lectures are available on our website. And um, I encourage uh, people to go check those out. Um, but thank you again for your lecture today. Oh, you're welcome. And you know, I know folks, some folks are going to watch it at a later time. If you want to let them know, since I live in Whitewater and they can find me in the phone book, if they want to call me after they've watched and have a question, I'll be glad to talk to them. That's very generous of you. Thank you so much, Professor Dick Haven.